waiting anxiously at the back, so we'll get started. Uh, I guess daily Bible reader head count. And do we have any quarterlies, or do we have anybody that needs a quarterly? We need one quarterly, Scott, if you've got one. Mr. Jerry left it again. I forgot it again. It's okay. I've got plenty. Anybody else need a quarterly? Before we start with our lesson, Brother Derek, would you mind leading us in a word of prayer? We are continuing our study with uh, about Samuel, and we're on Lesson 10, and the title of the lesson is Samuel Condemns Saul's Sacrifice, and as I thought about the lesson and I thought about that title, uh, a thought came to me which is not a big, profound, deep, theological thought, uh, and probably isn't very controversial in this audience, but I thought that, you know, it's okay to condemn sin. That thought came to me that you know, Samuel condemned sin, and it's okay for us to condemn sin. And again, in this audience, that's a, a duh kind of, kind of statement to make. Yeah, Chris, of course it's okay to condemn sin. Jesus condemns sin. God condemns it. The writers throughout the Bible condemn sin, and uh, they're not shy. They're not bashful, just like Samuel's not in our lesson that we're going to look at this morning. But if we go outside those doors, out into the world, that statement might be a little more controversial when I say that it's okay to condemn sin. And we might find more disagreement if we stand up against sin than we would inside this audience. I may have said this before uh, in, in service here, but I, I think there are people who don't know any scriptures except Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not, lest you be judged. And that may be the only verse in the Bible that they know, but by George, they know that. And if you try to point out sin, they will be quick to quote Matthew 7, verse 1. You can't judge me. You know, Jesus himself said, you can't judge. And, and it's unfortunate that, that they quote that and read that verse and don't read the rest of the chapter, Don, because if they read the rest of that chapter, they would find Jesus saying, uh, in effect, you need to take care of your own sin, and then you'll be able to see sin in others, and you'll be able to help others correct their sin. So they missed the point of that chapter completely. But there is a very large sect of people who, f who feel like and, and promote this idea that we can't condemn sin, we can't point out sin in others. In fact, the biggest sin that we can make is to say that there is sin and that people do sin. And that's the biggest thing that we can do wrong. And yet in the Bible... Men like Samuel are very quick to point out sin, and they don't sugarcoat it. They don't try to, to ease their way around it. They call sin what it is, and they're very uh, harsh even in pointing out the consequences of sin, and I think we'll see that this morning. Uh, our lesson is in chapter 13, but I want to go back to chapter 12 in the last couple of verses because I think they, they fit in nicely with our lesson in chapter 13. Uh, the last couple of verses in 1 Samuel chapter 12... Uh, Samuel's talking to the people, and he's giving them some warnings. He's anointed Saul as king, and he's warning the people about going away from God. And he says, beginning in verse 24, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Uh, I, I, it reminds me of Deuteronomy 28. 
uh, that chapter. And if you haven't read that chapter in a while, go read it. Uh, I think W.A. once uh, in a Bible class just read Deuteronomy 28. I remember that W.A. and had very little commentary, just read that, and it left an impression on me because that chapter, uh, most of it is spent warning people, warning the Israelites about the consequences of not following God. He spends the first maybe 20% of that chapter uh, telling them what great things are going to happen if they do follow God. And then about 80% of that chapter is spent warning them, the Israelites, about all these consequences of not serving God and falling into sin. And if you read that, boy, those things are just as applicable today as they were back then when, when they were given to the Israelites. And, and Samuel here is, again, warning these people, not only you, but your king, too, are in risk of, of falling away from God. And you need to remember the great things that God has done for you. And where Saul is going to get in trouble, and where the people are going to get in trouble, too, is they're going to forget the great things that God has done for them over the years. W.A.? Right, and again, just as applicable today as, as it was when it was written. Thank you for that. Uh, chapter 13, let's begin and, and read the first, um, the first few verses of chapter 13 because there's, there's something interesting to me that's going to happen here that kind of sets all this in motion. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Mishmash in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in uh, Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it, uh, said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines, and the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. Uh, so, in effect, Saul sends his son and, and sends some troops to sort of take care of the Philistines and the writer of our, our text or our book points out that this was probably not meant to be a war uh, because you probably don't take 3,000 troops and, and declare a war on the Philistines but rather they, they may just have been a show of force or trying to keep the Philistines at bay and just as a warning to them but for whatever reason Jonathan attacks and has this victory and that's going to start a full on war uh, with the Philistines, this group of people that Israel had trouble with on and off for, for several generations in the Old Testament. But the ironic thing is, if you go back to chapter 7 and look at verse 13, before the people asked for a king, Jesus then said, uh, before they demanded a king, a rather, it says, so the Philistines were subdued and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And, and the hand of the again, Lord was uh, against the, the Philistines again. all the days of Samuel. Three times, so that, bang, that bang, bang, was he said, "Here's what." In God's effect, when said. Samuel was the judge, when he was in charge, when there was no king, and it says the Philistines were subdued, they were taken care of. What were the two reasons that Israel demanded a king? We always point out the first one that they wanted to be like the other nations around them. But what was the other reason they wanted a king? They wanted a leader of a military to fight their battles. They wanted a king to go fight their battles. It's ironic that when they didn't have that, when it was God's plan with this judge, that the Philistines were taken care of. And now that they went to get this, this king to fight their battles for them, now all of a sudden they're having these troubles with the Philistines. It's almost like it was a self-fulfilling prophecy that let's get a king to fight our battles. Well, we don't have any battles to fight, but then we get this king, and suddenly we have problems with the Philistines. W.A., do you have a comment? Sure, sure.
Yeah. You're probably right. You're probably right, Don. Yeah. Let's uh, let's go back to chapter ten of verse eight before we before we read the the text that's in our book, uh, chapter ten, verse eight, because this is really important and and kind of is going to tell us what the problem is with with Saul here in this chapter. Uh, Samuel had anointed Saul as king. He's about to present. Saul to the people as their new king, their first king. And in verse 8 of chapter 10, he says to Saul, You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So keep that in the back of your mind as we read uh, our text from chapter 13, that Samuel has given instructions, go wait seven days, then I, Samuel, am going to come and offer a sacrifice. So let's continue our reading uh, in chapter 13 with verse 5. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Mishmash to the east of Beth-Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. So already they've forgotten what Samuel had told them uh, earlier, uh, you know, what we read in chapter 12, to, to consider what great things God has done. They've already forgot about God helping them defeat this big Egyptian army when they left Egypt and helping them take the land of Canaan and the giants that were in that land. They've forgotten that, and they're running and hiding from this Philistine army. Uh, now, I, I can sort of understand why they were running, because uh, 30,000 chariots is a whole lot of chariots uh, when you don't have any, and uh, those chariots would probably go through the, the Israelites pretty, pretty handily unless God was on their side, which he had been as long as they were faithful to him. Uh, they had been, so... Right now at this point is a perfect opportunity for somebody, hopefully the king, to step up and show some leadership. Uh, You think about the great leaders that we've had uh, in our country and in other countries. When do we see their leadership come through? When everything's rosy and and times are good? Uh, You see it in in the the tough times, uh, the, the hard times. That's when the leaders step up and they show things is in that moment of crisis we see what kind of leader somebody is. And, and Israel definitely needs somebody right now to say, look, God is, God is still in control. If we're faithful to him, he's going to be faithful to us. Unfortunately, uh, that's not what they're going to get from their king. Uh, in verse 9, or verse 8, Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and a peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him and that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Mishmash, then I said, The Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Then Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin and Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. So Saul had been told, go wait seven days. Samuel's going to come and offer a sacrifice. He, He does part of it. He starts off on the right track. He waits the appointed time, but then he gets impatient and takes it upon himself to offer the sacrifice. So the question I have is, what's the big deal? Why does it matter? 
Why does it matter who offered the sacrifice? You know, shouldn't Samuel have said, Saul, your heart was in the right place. Now, Saul, you had good intentions. You, 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 you got impatient, but man, you, you were at least offering worship to God. That's what we'd say today, isn't it, Don? We'd say, boy, your heart was in the right place. At least, at least you did what felt good. At least you, you followed your heart and your instincts, and, and good job. And we'd give him a pat on the back, or at least a lot of people would. He used that, that language, I'm, I was compelled. Uh, almost like he was saying, I didn't have a choice. And I was compelled. I was almost forced by my, by my conscience and my, my thoughts to do this. And that wasn't acceptable to, to Samuel. I want to read uh, what, what the author of the teacher's commentary says about sacrifices because I'll mess it up if I try to... Uh, to, to summarize it, but I think he does a good job talking about what the sacrifice was supposed to be and what maybe Saul saw the sacrifice as being and maybe some insight onto what, what he did and why he was so impatient to offer this sacrifice. Uh, it says the English word sacrifice is from a Latin root that means a sacred gift. And we know that God doesn't need a gift from us as far as him needing a gift. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. He doesn't need a gift from us. But the author points out that if sacrifices had been all that it took to enlist the support of God, whether Saul or Samuel offered them would not have mattered. So if it was just a lucky charm, just some kind of magic thing or, or a, a deal where I scratch your back, God, and you scratch mine, then it wouldn't have mattered if Samuel or Saul or whoever offered it would have been insignificant. Uh, on the other hand, sacrifices served a different, purses, a different purpose. Number one, they functioned as a national confession of faith by means of sacrifices, everyone acknowledged that victory belonged to God. And number two, they served to remind the people of Israel that their covenant with God extended beyond sacrifices and battles. Whether it was in the gifts they offered or in the way they treated their neighbors, they were to obey him. God had chosen a priesthood to present offerings, and he had chosen an altar on which they were to burn. Who offered the sacrifices mattered. The reason, the reason it mattered is simply it's the way God set it up to be. God said, these are the people that are going to offer the sacrifices. Samuel reminded him, I'm the one that's going to come offer the sacrifice. And Saul, maybe this power and authority is going to his head. He goes and does what he wants. To me, it's an issue of authority. And if we're not careful, we can fall into that same trap today of taking authority on ourselves that God has not given us. And uh, I, I thought of, uh, in, in our worship, there's so many things that people in the world take authority on in worship that God has not given us. Uh, we've got some very talented ladies in our our congregation who could probably get up and give a much better sermon than I ever could. But they don't have authority. Uh, there are things that uh, we do in worship that, boy, if I'd, if I'd been instituting it, I, I would have done things differently. I, I would have set up the Lord's Supper maybe with cornbread and sweet tea because I prefer that to unleavened bread and grape juice personally. But I don't have the authority to change that because God has, has said this is what you're going to do. And he was pretty adamant about who's going to offer the sacrifices and how it was to be done. And Saul, even though he was king and had all this earthly power, he didn't have the authority to change that. So I think it's an issue of authority. Sure. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a priest. Exactly. He was a king. But he still had to answer to God, even though he was a king. Uh, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, what does that say? There's a way that seems right, the end thereof are the ways of death. And, and just because we think we know best sometimes, uh, 
that can lead us into a bad situation as it did to King Saul. I want to look at a, another incident in the Old Testament that I think Saul could have learned from in Leviticus chapter 10, and, and this is a story that's probably familiar to all of us, but Nadab and Abihu, similar, similar kind of deal here. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now verse 3 gives us some, some insight on the, to why this happened to them. Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. The, the, Saul made the same mistake that Nadab and Abihu did. He took it upon himself to worship or offer a worship that, that the way he wanted to. Just like they didn't glorify God, they didn't regard God as holy in their worship, I think Saul did the same thing by offering a sacrifice or a burnt offering that he didn't have the authority to do so. And Samuel rebuked him because he didn't care. The fact that he was compelled to do it, Saul was, didn't really seem to bother Samuel. Jackie? And, and so we're living faithfully and, and uh, not just ending at baptism. Some people would end at uh, before baptism, but they would end there. And, and once we have this feeling, hey, we're good forever. Well, we see right here from Saul that feelings aren't good enough. Saul felt compelled, and, and his, his motives might have been good. And, and he might have been trying to do the right thing, but, but he messed up in a pretty big way. And I want to pose this, uh, this question to you. You see Samuel's rebuke. Uh, he, he told him the consequences of sin. And again, that's a reminder to us that the sin has consequences. The kingdom's going to be taken away from him. It's going to be given to somebody else. Uh, Samuel didn't know it at the time, but the, that was going to be David. It was going to get this kingdom. Uh, the, the natural succession would have been that Jonathan would have been the next king. But because of his actions right here, that's not going to happen. And sometimes I wonder why some people in the Bible are given second chances and others aren't. You know, Saul wasn't given another chance. It was you messed up and the kingdom is gone. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, they weren't given a second chance. Uh, Uzzah, when he reached out and touched that ark, wasn't given a second chance. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Brother Anderson in his lesson talked about Peter. How many chances was Peter given? But when he was confronted with his sin, he wept bitterly. When Peter denied Jesus and he was confronted with that, well, he was sorrowful. He repented. Uh, King, sure. Uh, King David, when, he, when King David was confronted by Nathan, that you've done this terrible thing, you've not only committed adultery, you've committed murder, he didn't blame others the way that Saul did. He said, I have sinned. And you don't see too many people in the Bible saying, I have sinned, but David was one of them. But, but look at Saul's reaction. What does Saul do? When confronted with his sin, Saul blames everybody else. Well, it was the people. The people, they were running from me. I was all alone. They, they, they scattered. It was the people's fault. Sure, let's blame the next person. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and the serpent, you know, I guess he didn't have anybody to blame. He blamed Samuel. King, 
Can you imagine the, the gall that you would have to blame Samuel, the, 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 this, this prophet, this judge from God, to blame him because you were, you were late? Well, whether he was late, whether he was early, it's still, like you say, W.A., didn't give, didn't give Saul a bit more authority than he had. And, uh, boy, sure, sure. And I can, I can almost picture Saul offering this sacrifice or this offering, and then Samuel rounds the corner, and he sees it. Uh, and uh, Almost like when your kids do something that they know they're not supposed to be doing, and you round the corner and you see them, and, and mine jump. I don't know, y'all may not jump, but mine at least jump. Now, they keep on doing whatever they were doing, but they at least it scares them for a moment. Well, Saul, I, I don't see that he feels like he did anything wrong. Instead, he just makes excuses, blames everybody else, the people, Samuel, uh, the Philistines. In effect, he's blaming God, too, when he blames the fact that the Philistines are, are attacking. It's almost like he's blaming God. Well, God, I had to offer this sacrifice to you before you'd come and help me. Don? And that's where his, he didn't have those leadership skills to say, and that faith to say, look, guys, whether we're, we're 600 of us or against 30,000, it doesn't matter if God is on our side. Sure. Almost like he thought it was magic that, hey, I offered this sacrifice, and now God has no choice but to help me. But that's not how the sacrifices work, uh, and that's, that's not what he was supposed to do. But I, I think Saul is, is a sad case because he's wasted talent, wasted opportunity. If you study the kings throughout Israel, there were some wicked, wicked men that had no redeeming qualities whatsoever that the Bible tells us about. Saul, I don't think, was one of those. I don't think he was one of those just extremely wicked people without any good qualities. He had some... He had some good qualities. You read about those in his early life, but he didn't cultivate those. He didn't keep working on them, and, and he allowed his arrogance, his lack of faith, and his um, impatience to, to overtake him and to bring him down as a king. And it's a sad story to me, and ultimately his kingdom would not go to his son. It would go to uh, David, who would make his own mistakes, but always was pinned it when he did and, and turned back to God. Any comments before we, we close? I heard one bell. Well, and, and they're very willing to judge Christians for, for the way we live and the way we try to conduct ourselves. Those same people that would say, don't judge, are, are some of the most judgmental people that you'll run across. So. Thank you all for being here and your, your good comments. I appreciate it.